Okay, so um, yeah, I see Divya's comment. Um, so I was thinking of the Lord Jesus. Right. Okay. Okay, so um, so let's look at. Um, yeah, I think some more people have to join. Okay, we'll get started. So let's look at uh, the Lord Jesus. You know, we, we were saying that the Lord Jesus, he actually modeled leadership in a way that the world hadn't seen. Right? And the world still, you know, looks to that and uh, find that, okay, this is something that we need to do. Right? Uh, this is something that is very effective. Okay. So uh, this is what the Lord Jesus said. Right? Uh, Matthew chapter 20 and verses 25 to 28. Um, Matthew Sorry, let me just put that verse up. He says, uh, um, the Son of Man did not come to serve, but rather to, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Right? Um, Matthew 20, verse 25, Jesus called them to himself and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And those who are great exercise authority over them. Okay, so it's, a, it's interesting, you know, why he says this, right? The context in which he says this. So let's go to Matthew chapter uh, 20. And uh, let's look at, you know, how this whole conversation comes about, right? So, um, Matthew chapter 20, and if we, if we start at verse 20, uh, it says, Then the mother of Zebedee's uh, sons came to him with her sons, kneeling down and asking something from him, asking something from Jesus. And he said to her, What do you wish? Uh, she said to him, Grant this, that these two sons of mine may sit one on your right hand and the other on your left in your kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, you do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They said to him, we are able. So he said to them, you will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it is prepared by my father. And verse 24 and when the ten heard it, they were greatly displeased with the two brothers. You know, the, so all the other disciples, they were they were upset. They were like, you know, how can you even allow your mother to ask uh, such a question to the Lord? You know, put forth such a request to the Lord, and uh, you know, to sit at the right end. And what about us? You know, are we are we not all together? You know, maybe they were all you know thinking this. So it says, well, it just says that they were displeased with the two brothers, uh, but. Jesus called them to himself. And obviously he saw and he knew in his heart that this was what was going on. So he called them to himself and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. Okay, so they boss over them, uh, whoever they are ruling over. And those who are great exercise authority over those who whom they rule over. And then he says in verse 26, yet, it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man, okay, so he's saying, let him be your servant, let him be your slave, just as the Son of Man, okay, just like Jesus, just like me, just like the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Okay, so, so he just exposed them, opened their eyes to see him and to see his perspective of why he had come. You know, they, they, had, they had seen, you know, if you, if you actually, um, you know, read the, the book of Matthew and see all this uh, and read through up to this point, um, there are a lot of things that has happened. Um, 
the Lord Jesus is transfigured on the mount. Uh, he, you see that there's a healing that happens. Uh, many who are touch him are made well. Uh, everything that happens one after the other after the other. And in fact, there is also uh, a question about you know, who is the greatest. The conversation that the disciples themselves have as they are journeying from one place to another. You know, uh, who is uh, they are having that kind of a you know uh, discussion and so on. And in fact, they ask the Lord, you know, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Who is the greatest? Right. So all this has happened, and it comes to this place when the Lord says, "Okay, this is who I am. This is why I came to the earth." So He's exposing them to the truth of or, or an aspect of leadership. Probably they hadn't been. Uh, they they had they had seen. They were familiar with this kind of leadership, where they had seen rulers. Uh, you know, they were under the Roman rule, so they had seen maybe the mis, uh, mishandling of people. They had probably seen the abuse of authority, uh, and all that was fresh in their memory, right? So the Lord is saying, you know, you know that you know the rulers of the Gentiles. You know how do they do it? They lord it, they boss over them. You know the ones who have authority. You know how they exercise authority. He's saying, you know, I'm teaching you something. I'm telling you something that you cannot do the same thing. You know, it shall not be the same with you. Now you are going to serve in a different way. You're going to lead in a different way. You're going to exercise authority in a different way. So he's saying, those one who desires to be first, let him be your slave. One who desires to be um, great, let him be the servant. Okay. So um, ushering in a new. Um, uh, a, a new area or a new realm of leadership called servant leadership. Right? You, you, in order to lead, in order to be great, you serve. You know, you're here to serve people. And he says, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give himself, you know, sacrificially, live his, live his life and give his life as a ransom for. So, so he's talk many things that you see here in leadership. You're considering the ones whom you are leading as someone worth saving, or someone worth um, giving your life for, you know, sacrificing your life for, um, someone whom you count as precious or valuable. Right? All those aspects come in, and in saying, you know, the Son of Man came to serve, right? And we we see that he practically demonstrated that. In John chapter 13, verses 12 to 15. Okay, John said, let me just read John 13, verse 12. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, Do you not know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have uh, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Okay. Um, so what was that? When did this happen? This was before the crucifixion. They had gathered in the upper room and he, uh, the, the Bible says that he just took out his uh, outer garment and uh, who, like how uh, what a servant would do, he took on the Towel, took the you know the basin and the water and washed every person's every disciple's feet and they said you need to do you know do you know what I've done to you? Um, if I then, being the Lord and Teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. So he's saying I'm your Lord. You call me Lord and Teacher. Um, that is true. And as Lord and Teacher. I have done this to you, not as uh, anyone else. That is my identity. That is my. That is why you know you um, rightly have said so. Uh, I'm not discrediting that or disputing that. But as Lord and Teacher, I have washed your feet. Right. So he says, "This is I've given you an example." Verse fifteen. I've given you an example. That you should do as I have done to you. Okay, so a very powerful uh, 
physical example of uh, what he shared earlier. The Son of Man did not come to serve. So did not come to be served, but to serve. And here again, he is reiterating that with that task, you know, with that uh, practical example. And he said, this you need to do to one another. You need to wash one another's feet. Uh, you need to serve one another. And I've left this, uh, given this to you as an example. So uh, so servant leadership, the Lord Jesus bringing in that, um, which was, uh, which is uh, very powerful, uh, which is quite a shift uh, uh, in in thought and action uh, with regard to leadership, right? So we see this, uh, the Lord bringing in that. So, and when, when we look at the life of the Lord, okay, as a like his earthly ministry, um, so we see, uh, in addition to his the sacrificial uh, servant leadership, we see some other insights uh, on leadership that we will do well to learn and put to practice. Okay. Now, even before we go into that, you know, this whole aspect of ser servant leadership, it can be done wrong, it can be done right. Okay. Uh, there's a right way of doing it and there's a wrong way of doing it. Okay. Uh, the right way of, uh, you know, serving one another uh, without abdicating your you know, leadership, without you know letting go of what you're called to do, um, you know how you like with the gifting and everything. Uh, there's a right way of doing it, and we're going to you know in further on when we study actually the life of the Lord Jesus, we we get some insights on that as well. Right. So let's let's look at this. Um, but as a leader. Okay, we're going to look at some, I think, some seven uh, insights, seven aspects. Um, so let's start with the first one. Okay, um, John chapter twelve and verse twenty-seven. The Lord Jesus, uh, he was nearing the time of crucifixion, and this is what he says: "Now my soul is troubled, but and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose I came." To this hour, right? For this purpose, I actually came. For this particular thing, you know, this was the main thing for which I came and lived my life and did these things. So he was very uh, uh, clear about the purpose, okay, his life purpose, and uh, his role and function. Okay, he was very, very clear. Uh, this was something that was settled in his heart. So he would not be distracted from it. He would not be uh, complacent about it. Uh, no one can talk him out of it. Right? No one can intimidate him out of it, talk him out of it, argue him or reason him out of it. Right? So he knew the purpose. Okay. So as leaders, as a leader, the Lord Jesus knew his purpose. So this is something for us to learn. What is the purpose um, for which I'm here? Right? So that is why identity and purpose, and uh, yeah, if we, in whatever we are doing, right? In whatever we are doing, whatever, wherever we are serving, it's so very important because the Lord Jesus knew the purpose and, and nothing would actually take him out of that. Okay, so, uh, uh, example that we see is Matthew chapter 16. Okay, if you look at Matthew 16, verses 21, um, it says that from that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Then Jesus took him aside, oh, sorry, then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Okay, so the Lord Jesus began teaching uh, and um, Matthew chapter 16, 21. Okay. So, um, um, because uh, before that, if you see, you know, uh, uh, like he just asked Peter, you know, Peter saying, who do, son of man, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you know, you are, um, 
Christ, you are Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. And the Lord actually commends him and says that uh, you, know, you are blessed because flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. But my father was in heaven and upon this revelation, upon this rock, I will build the church. Right? So he commends him. And it says that from that time on, okay, that you know, upon that the truth and the uh, revelation that he is the Christ, the Son of the Living God. From that time on, he began to teach them. He began to teach them how you know, he needs to go to Jerusalem. He needs to suffer many things. Um, he needs to, you know, he, he will die and, and he will be killed. Uh, and on the third day, he raised again. Now, now Peter were very upset with this. Right, this kind of teaching and uh, whatever the Lord was saying, uh, he was very upset. And, and so it says that he, Peter actually took him aside. Okay, verse 22, he took him aside, says, and rebuked him. Okay, just, just imagine, he's saying, uh, you know, Peter being that impulsive, uh, you know, uh, very spontaneous and uh, character uh, that, he, that he was. So he just, he rebukes the Lord. He says, um, you know, how, can, how dare you say that? You know, why are you talking like this? He rebukes him. You need to stop doing this. So he says, far be it from you, Lord. This shall not happen to you. Okay. Uh, and he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. For you are an offense to me. For you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Okay. So he, he was able to discern where this whole thing was coming from. Where this uh, uh, Peter's uh, ideas, where they were coming from, so you know where this Peter's rebuke and and even though it was sincere, even though it seemed like uh, to be good, right? Um, the Lord discerned where it was coming from, and since he was so clear about his purpose, right? Why did he come on the earth? Why did he come to the earth? Why did he? Why was he here to minister? He was so clear. He said, "You know, uh, get behind me, Satan. For you are not mindful of the things of God, but you just." It means it, it says, you know, very interesting. The second part of it is, but the things of men. Okay, so Satan is mindful of the things of men in the sense it could be a very humanistic thing. Uh, it might come as something that is very good. Satan is mindful of it. So he's saying, the Lord is saying, you are not mindful of the things of God, but you are actually mindful of the things of men. You are an offense. This humanistic thing, this thing, the, the things of men, this earthly, fleshly thing, it's an offense. right? And, um, and he's saying that, yes, um, this is my purpose. I will not be distracted from it. This is the purpose of God. This is the call of God. I will not be moved away from it. I will not be distracted, even though it comes like good advice and wisdom. I will not be distracted from it. So we see that uh, you know the, our call, the purpose, uh, our assignment. If we are not sure, uh, as leaders, we're going to be making decisions, making choices, uh, putting resources um, behind like resources, when I say resources, we're talking about, of course, money and time and skills and all that um, behind certain things, maybe projects, maybe uh, assignments, uh, which is going to involve people and involve, you know, if you're in ministry, involve the church and etc. And um, it's it's going to be a, a, a drain. It's going to be a waste. Why? Because it's it's not the things of God, but it's the things of men, right? So, um, so knowing the, the purpose, knowing the intention, knowing the direction uh, is very, very important. And and uh, it's it's not a difficult thing, but uh, it involves walking with the Lord. It's not an impossible thing to know, because we know that Lord. The Lord wants to. He's called us to be influencers. He's called us to be leaders. Therefore, He makes that uh, that information, makes that wisdom available for us. Right? So it's not something that is outside of our grasp, outside of our reach.
Okay, it's something that the Lord wants for us and gives us as well. Okay, um, Matthew chapter 15 and verse 14, God says, let them alone, they are blind leaders of the blind, and if the blind leads the blind, both will fall into a ditch. He's talking about influence without discernment, you know, having influence without a strong grip on purpose, right? Uh, having influence, so if, if that is so, then saying it will have its consequence, because as the blind lead the blind, one who does not have a sense of, one who's unable to see, Right, where we are going, um, well, he's going to lead himself and the ones who, whom he is leading into a place where they are not supposed to be going. Right? It says both will fall into the ditch right? and come to a place which is, which is not good uh, for, for them. So, so the Lord says this is what it is. Um, so we will end up leading others not into their destiny because, well, leadership is about influencing others for their good, which involves, you know, discovering who they are, discovering what they have been given, and leading them to a destiny in God. Now, if you're not clear about the purpose, then we can actually lead them to a destiny which is not really, you know, what they are meant to go, the place where they are not meant to go. Uh, it could fall short of the destiny that God has in store for them, right? So, so the beautiful thing is this: in in all this, you know, there is room for correction. You know, there is room for you you turn. There is room for a left turn. There is room room for you know in that journey as we wait upon the Lord right? as leaders. There is room for correction. There is room for change. That's a beautiful thing, right? There is because this whole aspect of grace for leadership. So it takes a very, very, I don't know, obstinate and stubborn and rebellious heart to miss all these signs uh, and to go astray. Right? If, if we're so willful and so stubborn and so rebellious, then you miss out on this. But if we are, our posture of our heart is to, to receive, is to, is to glorify, you know, if that is settled, then uh, it's a safe place, right? Okay, so uh, so the Lord uh, says that you know, he is, his purpose, his uh, reason, uh, uh, and the price. He was willing to pay the price. He was willing to you know, go through that pain and everything because he was clear that this was the purpose. So also for us. So this is a very important lesson that we read, as uh, that we um, uh, that we see and that we know as leaders that know your purpose, right? The second one that we see uh, in the life of the Lord Jesus is that he was selfless. Okay, so it was not about him, it was about others. So he was, uh, well, the focus was on the other. Right? It was not on the self, you know, what can I get? How can I be elevated? How can I be, how become famous, popular? Uh, it was not about that. His focus was not that. Right? Philippians 2, talks about that. Uh, let nothing, their instruction, Paul writes, let nothing be done through, Philippians 2 verse 3, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So this was the mindset or outlook that the Lord Jesus had. So Paul is saying uh, to the Philippine church, that let this mindset, let this thought pattern, uh, let this outlook be in you also, which was, which was first of all in the Lord Jesus. So let's look back again. Let nothing be done through selfish, ambition or conceit in pride but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than oneself than himself let each of you look out not only for his own interests but also 
Now, that's a very important thing. Now, as a leader, you know that, OK, God has called me you know, to do this. Uh, there's a purpose. It is very strong. And I need to reach this. Uh, there are certain goals that God has set before. Uh, and I need to reach that. You know, I don't want to be you know, distracted from that goal. Okay, so that's the first thing that we saw, right? He was not distracted. He was not. He was not going to be swayed by any reasoning, any logic, anything that would come contrary to that, right? So here we see in Philippians two and verse four, let each one of you look out not only for his own interests. Okay, that is good, but also for the interests of others. Okay, in looking out for our own interests, are we putting down the interests of others or the good of others? In 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 wanting, you know, for us to reach a particular place, particular destiny, particular destination, are we not considering the good of others? So, so that is uh, important. It's it's so. In other words, it's like saying, okay, I'm, it's not like you reach the place no matter what. You know, no matter what happens, no matter how people fall by the wayside, no matter what casualty, right? So it's it's not that it's saying you look out for the interests of others also. So this is the mind, or this is the kind of outlook that the Lord Jesus had. See, so it's a, again a very radical thing, where being selfless and not selfish, it's not uh, you know achieving certain thing at whatever cost right it's not uh, in, the, in the sense when you know we need to understand it right you know in the sense if it's a great price to pay okay but it's not at whatever you know, in the sense we are not looking out for the good of others yeah so um, being selfless being uh, the focus not being on oneself um, so as a leader the lord jesus taught that the third one is that the Lord, he was obedient. He was in communion with the Father, and he was, he was obedient to the voice of the Father. Okay, that's the third thing that we see. Um, you know, he, he, what aspects of it? At Father's instruction, first of all, he was sensitive to the Father's voice. He knew, he identified, he was well acquainted with the Father's voice and he knew his will he knew his timing and uh, uh, so all that was good but, the, but over and above that he was also obedient right he was uh, he, he, he said okay i need to do this and i will do it that he was obedient to the father okay um to the will of the father okay. uh, hebrews 10 and verse 7 then I said, Behold, I have come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me to do your will, O God. Okay, saying, I have come to do your will, O God. Okay, we're going back to Philippians 2 now. Philippians 2 and verse 8. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient. Okay, so a leader is not only someone who is uh, you know who is uh, who's selfless who is, is not only someone who is uh, who's got a grasp on what the purpose is and um, and all that but also someone who's you know when we think of leaders we think of okay, someone who's leading come someone who's always directing you know and that's very strong right in a leader um, influencing others and collectively being able to direct people for their good of course so uh, so that aspect is very strong but also we see that as a leader the question is you know is that person uh, a follower right? will that person be obedient and we're talking about christian leadership so will that person be obedient to the voice of the lord okay or is it going to is the is his own voice or her own voice going to be louder uh, than the voice of the Lord, the voice of the Spirit? So you see here that 
as a leader, he was obedient. Okay. As a son, he was obedient to a father. The will, the purpose, the timing, uh, no matter what the cost, he was obedient. It says here, uh, Philippians 2 and verse 8, uh, he humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. Okay, so he was well aware of the Father's will, well aware of the timing, uh, well aware of the purpose, and he was obedient. Okay, so so that's another quality of a leader to be to be a follower of Christ, right? to be a follower of Christ, not just leading others to Christ, not just pointing others to Christ, or you know pointing others to the purposes of Christ. You know, okay, this is we this is what we need to do as a church. This is what you know we need to do as a ministry and all that. Uh, you know, pointing others to that. The, the the plan, the purpose, the the direction, pointing others to Christ. Well, that is great. But here we see that he himself was obedient, personally obedient, sensitive obedient. Right? So that's that's a big one. As a leader, I'm following, obedient to the voice of the Father, the voice of the Spirit. Right? So as leaders, we see that just like the Lord was, we need to be obedient uh, of uh, obedient and sensitive to the will and voice of the Father. Okay, so we looked at three things now. So any any other further thoughts, any questions? Um, you know, any challenges that you might think, okay, in uh, actually applying this, right? Um, in daily life, you know, maybe you are in your situation, in your work situation or life situation. You know, do you foresee anything that could be, uh, you know, of course, you know, leadership is challenging, but uh, anything we can talk about that also, right? Okay, so what is the difference between a leader and a mentor? Okay, well, it's uh, the the fact is that. Uh, when we when we when we see that okay, uh, leadership is about influence. Um, it's it's I, I guess it's uh, in my opinion it's interchangeable. A mentor is also a leader, you know, because you are leading that person uh, into the things, journeying where uh, and influencing that person uh, for their good. Right, a mentor does that, and through experience, through the wisdom, and through the path that. You have already crossed. Uh, you're doing that, so uh, well. I would say that it is. Uh, it, it would be used interchangeably. Yeah. Yeah, Jafina, you have a question. Yes, Pastor. So uh, let's say uh, a leader is going through some struggles. <laughs> I mm. mean, we've created an example. People started following us. Uh, we've been so strong throughout the journey. But mm. uh, maybe at some point, we have some different situations in life. And uh, finally, we come to a point of struggling. And we, uh, I mean, every leader is also imperfect right I, I think so <laughs> I, yeah, I do. Uh, work in progress yes definitely yeah so uh, does it mean the leader has to hide his struggles and still portray himself as a strong one or uh, I mean or he should go and find out help or what's the mm. whole thing yeah so Okay, I, I'm just looking at Lovega's comments. Uh, I'll just come back, Jeffina. Uh, role, role of the leader is to mentor, but not all mentors are leaders. How, how all leaders are mentors? Okay. Um, uh, I, I guess, uh, Lovega, you're talking about a particular, you know, a, a, an official title of mentor and leader. Well, if that is the case, yes, this would, it would apply because not all, all mentors need to be leaders in an official capacity. But if you look at leadership as um, someone who is influencing people for the better, then 
we would say that well all mentors are leaders as well right okay so coming back to jeffina's um, you know question about uh, uh, leaders uh, you know with uh, with strengths and weaknesses right with with uh, limitations so how how do we uh, how do we lead in that do do we do we is it good for a leader to expose his or her weakness uh, to be vulnerable uh, or you know do we have to portray ourselves hide our weaknesses and say okay uh, this is what uh, i need to do so i just open it open this question up to the class and uh, maybe i'll make some comments later once i hear from you a anyone wants to answer that okay divya you want to go ahead yeah, I think there is uh, nothing wrong with uh, being transparent about uh, some struggles that we are going through, especially uh, I'm talking in a context of uh, leading a not in a, you know, uh, distant way, but leading in a very personal way, uh, maybe in the context of mentoring. Uh, so I, I don't think there is any um problem in being transparent um if you are going through a struggle and of course i have had mentors in my life who would be uh you know uh really open about it and tell me how they depend on god uh to go through certain situations so i found it very helpful because even when I'm going through a difficult situation, I can always, um, you know, go to what they went uh, to. Ultimately, they depend on, on God. So uh, in a Christian context, uh, it is it is actually very uh, good uh, to be transparent about uh, the struggles, not in a very detailed way, may, may not be everything that the leader is going through, but at least uh to as a testimony maybe yeah that is really helpful i believe okay okay so a leader can um, can be candid about whatever he or she is going through um uh, and so so jeffina's question is uh, you know to the person whom that person is leading right um can they you know can they talk candidly about their weaknesses, their limitations. Yeah. So, yeah. Thanks, Divya. So, anyone else? Anyone else? Um, John, you have some thoughts. What do you think? Um, okay, so, uh, okay, firstly, we just want, uh, you know, establish the fact that uh, all of us, you know, whether we are in a position of leadership, you know, officially in a position of leadership or not, uh, you know, we we are uh, people who are work work in progress, right? So there are certain areas where uh, the Lord has worked on us, and we are definitely strong in those areas. And there are certain areas which are progressively being worked upon, and maybe it's not in that place of strength yet. Okay. So the for, for, so from the, for the for the leader the leader's perspective is okay these are areas that i've identified as my limitations and i'm working on it okay so you're not insecure about it but you recognize that these are things that uh, that are not where it should be right uh, maybe certain skills maybe certain things like okay people skills maybe i'm more of an analyst uh, technically i'm sound you know i'm more of a tech person i'm a leader in that aspect uh, knowledge and understanding but when it comes to people maybe there is a 
uh, you know, there's an area of uh, limitation. Maybe I need to develop that. Okay, but as long as the leader knows that, okay, and also continually working on it, so the perspective is that yes, uh, I'm working on it. It's I understand it, but I'm not insecure about it. Okay, so that's that's one thing. Okay, and. Um, yeah, like Rosalind is saying, a leader can always seek help from his or her leader and uh, necessary changes, yes, uh, provided he or she is not condemned or looked down for that weakness. Okay, so in, in the area of, you know, when you're working on it, we are working on that uh, on that particular area, or maybe skill, maybe something else, uh, you get help from whoever, whoever are your mentors and whoever are your leaders, and then you work on it. So so that's the thing, right? So, so the thing is not to... Um, you know, use it as a crutch uh, whenever it comes to, let's say, interacting with the team. Okay, interacting with those who are leading and to say, okay, you know, you know, I'm not really strong in this area. You know, not to really uh, bring that about and confess that over and over again. Right, uh, but it, you can be candid and say, I'm, hey, I'm working on this, or uh, or to even surround yourself with people or you know uh, that particular area to uh, take help uh, from people maybe in the team itself to to deal with that okay say so, okay i'm i'm not very good at it so i'm going to take this person's help to do that so that is also a good thing while you're continuing to work at it and uh, not uh, you know just ignore it uh, and do that okay but not really uh, overtly just you know say confess it and say i'm weak at it and uh, I, uh, you know, or maybe have self pity. Um, you know, that is one one thing that a leader should not do, right? Um, and also be in, in, insecure about it. You know, in order to cover up that insecurity, we might do, uh, people might try to deal with that in different ways, right? You know, we we we, we could probably uh, be very touchy about it. You know, like flare up, get upset. Every time that is pointed out, and use our author abuse our authority and say, okay, you know, this is none of your business. Uh, you know, it's it's not does not concern you, and you know, kind of pe put people in place and do that. So, um, so you know, those are certain things that a leader should not do. You know, uh, re react insecurely. Okay, some more comments here. Um, if we are, I believe, being humble enough to accept correction is also an important aspect of leadership, yes. Uh, but it takes humility to address the issue and not to be proud enough to deny any help. Very true. Okay. So, yeah. So does that help, uh, Jafina? So, it, uh, so we don't have to, you know, cover up, be insecure, and, uh, and say, okay, what will people say when they look at this, my weakness? It's fine. You... Uh, your your thing is to work at it, right? Improve it, and uh, correct it, and change it for the better. And while a person is working at it, well, always you can take help to deal with that particular area. You know, maybe maybe accounting is not strong. You know, take someone else to. You know, you're not maybe one person. The leader is not strong in it. You know, take help for counsel, for advice, to handle that particular thing. For example, you know, do things like that. Does that help, uh, Jafina? Yes, Pastor, it helps. Thank you. OK, OK. OK, any other uh, questions? Like from whatever we have seen so far, you know, being selfless, being uh, obedient, and uh, you know, knowing our purpose. Um, any questions on that? Any thoughts on that? Any additional thoughts on that? Okay. Um, because it's it's important that it, these things don't remain, you know, good thoughts or uh, you know, good instructions. But we need to be able to translate this into action. Right. So that's where we see the fruit of this, because these are powerful truths, and this is what the Lord walked in. And uh, and the instruction is this: you know, the Lord 
doesn't want these to be options in our lives. It's very important, right? Because he's said very clearly, you know, yet it shall not be so with you. Okay, so which means I need to uh, you know, have a leadership style which is very different from that of you know, you know, which is con which is that which I, if I see something that is in the world which is contrary to the word or to his instruction, I need to uh, I need to kind of reject it, right? So, uh, you know, especially if you are in a corporate setting and if you, there are many kinds of people who are maybe, you know, who we are, we could be reporting to, we could be peers with, uh, he would, I mean, they would have different styles of leadership, but the Lord is putting this, you know, which means that this kind of a thing, you know, when you are leading people is not just for church and ministry, right? It's for, it's for life. Like it should be um, transferable in any uh, environment, family, right? uh, in any environment. Yeah. Okay, so uh, Divya has a question. Being obedient, how, how can that be practically applied in our context? Is it being obedient to God? So, yeah, first and foremost, yes, you know, that we are, we are not above the instructions that we give others you know above the law of god just because we are pointing others to the truth uh, that means that we we don't you know uh, we are not disobedient to us. so in that sense we are you know obeying god but also when it comes to obeying let's say generally rules and laws and instructions uh, maybe uh, which are common you know in a particular environment Okay, office, uh, home, maybe uh, different setup. You know, where commonly agreed upon rules, instructions. Um, so we are obedient in that in that sense, right? Uh, we follow. Okay, so but first and foremost, of course, we're talking about obedience to God, and in the context that we saw, the Lord Jesus being obedient to the Father, the Son being obedient to the Father. Okay. Um, yeah, would it be right for the leader to be very stern towards the youth who sometimes don't obey everything that the leader asks them to do? Okay, sternness. Okay, so you're talking about, uh, when you say stern, we're saying, okay, being firm uh, in whatever we are you know, standing for and uh, maybe the words and actions which follow because of that. Right? Would it be right for the leader to be strict? stern in thought, word and action, right? So it, it again depends what is the, uh, who sometimes don't obey everything that the leader asks them to do. Okay, so, uh, so of course, it is, we need to find out why, why they are not obeying. Uh, is it something very unreasonable? Is it something, you know, something, is it because of immaturity? Is it because, you know, all those things? And how critical is it? Right, so that's the thing. How critical is it? Because if, if, uh, if the baby is near the fire, and if it's going to be, uh, it's, if it's going to be a, if it's very, you know, we know that it's very critical for the life of the baby, of the child. Then yes, there is a certain uh, swiftness of action that is uh, this that is required from us. You know, there's no reasoning, there's no logic, and you know, all the sitting and sweet talking won't. It's a swift action to take to snatch the child from the fire. So it depends on how. What is it? You know, is it critical, or is it something that we can actually sit and talk about and reason? So yeah, so it depends on that. So if if we are, you know, if if it's something that we can sit and reason and talk and um, and uh, you know, we can if we have the time to do that, yeah. I'm sure we can do that, right? Um, but otherwise, if it's something critical, uh, it has to be addressed in that manner. Yeah. But uh, you know, because it is people, you know, because it is youth. Okay, young people. Uh, we are we are past the childhood stage. And they are at a place to, in a place of understanding, reasoning. Uh, I think that would help. 
then again it's a very general thing rosalind so that's why the answer is also a little general right okay okay so uh, that's all we have time for today so we'll stop right here and we'll meet again in our other classes thank you god bless uh, take care so we are meeting uh, next week right god bless thank you pastor right bye bye